It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Karen Daw, MBA, CECM, the MBA Masters in Business Administration, the CECM Certified Environmental Compliance Manager. Even if you think you've heard it all before, you've never heard it in the way Karen Daw, the OSHA lady, delivers OSHA and infection control training. With a fresh, fun, and efficient approach, Karen keeps things moving, always grounded in real-world examples of what can go wrong, sometimes in a matter of seconds, if we let our guard down. Karen Dahl is an award-winning national speaker, author of numerous articles and CE courses on safety and dentistry, and a consultant who practices across the country. She earned her BA from The Ohio State University and her MBA with concentrations in healthcare administration and business management. After graduation, Karen was recruited to from the emergency department to her roles as assistant director of sterilization monitoring and health and safety director for the OSU College of Dentistry. Karen draws on her rich background to educate audiences large and small on how not to do safety and best practices to avoid penalties, negative reviews, and the six o'clock news. And man, this is um this is really hit home for me because when I got out of school in 87. And please don't tell me you weren't born in 87. Uh, I just assume you weren't. Um, you know, you would talk, when I went to the CDC, whenever I was in Atlanta, I'd swing by the CDC. And, and uh, Dr. Dillenberg would give me the names of the dentists there and all that stuff. They had about 15,000 scientists. And they all had a hunch that there were these breakout diseases that might be traced back to this restaurant or this dental office or this and that. But it was more kind of like a detective and footwork game and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But man, today, it's a totally different game. I mean, you can have some good old boy dentist and Tulsa is just, just a good old boy, but doesn't know his autoclave stopped working. And the next thing you know, he's on the six o'clock news or shutting him down. I mean, it's just getting, and, and the CDC people will tell you that they can sit there and say, no, Howard did not get that disease at that restaurant or that office. Or in fact, he did. So it, it's really changed, hasn't it? It, it has. And you know, really, you can Google infection control breaches related to dentistry, primarily in uh, related to sterilization now. And there are no shortage of articles that you can pull up. And that's what's scary. It's that given the number of educators out there, the fact that this is part of dental school and dental hygiene, dental assisting school curriculums, that we still continue to make the news with these types of stories. So it's really scary. So Dental Town has uh, 50 forms, and if you go to any science place like NASA or, or any of these places we talked about, they all do the message board form just so you can, everything's at, um, searchable, it's indexed. And of these 50 forms, one of them's regulations, and I, I saw um, your post on that this morning, it was, it was awesome, but I want to ask an expert like you, under regulations, we have documentation, HIPAA, infection control, injury prevention in the workplace, and OSHA, um, or any of those redundant, or is that a good way to uh, do this? I think injury prevention in the workplace and OSHA is rather redundant because um, yeah. a lot, yeah. you know, here's the thing. A lot of people, they make bloodborne pathogens and OSHA synonymous with each other. What they forget is if you look at the top 10 things that dental offices were, dental offices were cited for in the past few years, bloodborne pathogens and infection control is only a sliver of that pie. O overall, OSHA is concerned with providing employees with a safe workplace. So I would say that injury prevention would would kind of work under that umbrella of OSHA. Yeah, that's what, that, that's what I was thinking. And your post was uh, very uh, interesting where you said, um, here, let me uh, pull it up. It says um, that HIPAA and OSHA should be two separate compliance programs. Um, OSHA infection control is very different than HIPAA cybersecurity. Um, t t talk about that. Is that, and, and what is your cup of tea? Do you do HIPAA and OSHA or do you think HIPAA and OSHA are just two totally separate animals? I think they're two totally separate animals. There are fabulous speakers out there who can speak to both of those. I'm definitely not one of them. I chose to focus <laughs> just on OSHA standards because the code of federal regulations governing healthcare is this thick. And I chose to focus on that manual. It's all eight point font. There's no pretty pictures. It is strictly text. And I had to pour through that manual front and back to look at what are some of the things that OSHA might visit a dental office for. And everybody, like I said, everybody thinks it's all bloodborne pathogens. And as long as I do my annual bloodborne pathogens training, um, that we're in compliance. And that's not necessarily the case. So I think if you were to break those two apart and work with experts in each of those fields, you're going to be better off. The other reason I 
recommend separating those two is because many times we saddle one individual in the office with compliance and this person might already be a practice manager or a dental assistant or a dental hygienist and they're doing it all. And when I see that, I see a breakdown in systems already. I already know what I'm getting into when I when I do a discovery call with a practice that has reached out to me and they said, I'm doing this, 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 and this, I'm, and I'm doing all of this, and it's not a team effort, then I worry. I already know what I'm getting into before I even visit the office. So, so you know, the, um, the neat thing we're doing here is most humans all live alone. I mean, you know, they, they, um, they drive to work alone, um, they, they spend a lot of time alone. So they really, when, when you're an individual dentist in the United States, you don't really know what's going on with the other 200,000 dentists in America or the 2 million dentists around the world. So she's driving to work right now and she's not you. What does what, what your end of the world look like? Why are people calling you? What are you doing? What, what, why, why is, uh, what, what's, what's going on in ocean infection control and, and, um, you know, the uh, Socrates said that humans only had two emotions. It was greed and fear. Uh, but I think biology said it better uh, that um, you're either a predator or you're being preyed on. So when you're a predator, you want resources, greed, good. But when someone's preying on you, that's frightening and scary. And you don't want to get arrested and fined and all that. So OSHA, um, infection control, gr greed, fear, predator, prey, what should they worry about? So I'm going to I'm going to flip that around just a little bit. The likelihood of a dental office being investigated by OSHA in most states, it's it's actually rather small. It is a complaint driven process. What we need to think about right now is that we now live in an environment where we if we don't get the results or the responses that we want if we're not being heard we're going to find somebody who's going to listen to us look at yelp reviews look at google reviews people can easily go online and complain about anybody we now have resources with regards to if i'm in a healthcare facility and i'm not happy with one aspect or another of the care that i received or if i just feel like i got bad bad customer service from the front desk team member well by golly, I'm gonna contact OSHA and I'm gonna contact the dental board and I'm gonna report you to somebody. I had an office that believes they were reported to OSHA over a billing dispute. And my, my poor front desk team members, they never get yelled at by patients, right? Over billing matters, never, ever, ever. So somebody was upset about it and on the way out, they said, well, I'll show you. And next thing you know, OSHA was visiting their practice. So I always wanna to try to get people to think, not necessarily in what, what you know, the fact that they could be inspected, but at the end of the day, it's about doing the right thing. If you're doing the right thing, you got nothing to worry about. And what, what's the worst thing what, that they worry about? What, what What's when um, Lady Luck is not on your side and everything goes bad? Is it, a, is it an infection outbreak? Is it a... Absolutely. Someone... So you're going to... You're going to potentially cause harm. And um, on top of that, if we're looking at OSHA and we're thinking about what possibly could happen while the dental board gets involved, you're looking at possible license suspension. Um, if OSHA is involved and they find a willful neglect scenario, and I've only seen this used in two dental offices that I'm aware of anyways from um, researching the OSHA website, two dental offices receiving the willful neglect fine currently that willful neglect fine, I don't think a lot of people realize this, Howard, it's $133,000 per occurrence. And on a daily basis, your practice can rack up uh, $13,300 in fines for every day that a particular hazard hasn't been abated. And I think that is a worst case scenario. Definitely gets people thinking. So it's big fines. So when you're out there in the field, what is the low hanging fruit? What what are what are my homies not doing right? Where 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 are they dropping the ball? I'm going to say uh, training, training upon hire and annual training, and this is what I see a lot of. And for some, and don't get me wrong, for some offices. Being able to do online training and watching a 30 minute video and checking off that box is a, is a good fit for their culture. I have been blessed that the people who reach out to me realize sometimes you don't know what you don't know and there's more to it than just a 30 minute video. So they realize that they want their training to be comprehensive. They want their team to get the same information. They wanna make sure they're doing the right things. So um, annual training and training upon hire, definitely another one is a, it, this one is trending actually, and that is water safety, water quality being used in the office. And I know people who are listening right now are gonna say, oh, uh, but if I test my water for bacterial counts, that's really 
just for patient safety and it's only a recommendation by the CDC, how is that mandatory? Well, we're being exposed to that, those aerosols that are being generated every time we irrigate or use a handpiece. Therefore, you want to make sure your team members aren't being exposed to bacteria in the water lines too, like Legionella or M. abscessus. Huh, that is... Uh... I would say that's the number one thing I think a lot of offices are not what, doing what I, right now. What I don't like about the uh, online training, and when I say that, I... I have online training courses on Dentaltown, so I'm shooting myself with the foot. Is uh, to me, it, it's I, I need to get this implemented. Um, is if someone comes in, and the only people getting referrals are if I give you money and you come in and it all gets done. They get educated. We get whatever we have to do. At the end of the day, we're all done. That that's what you want, as opposed to hoping that they went home and watched a video or you know took a test or something like that. I, I just want it done. Yeah, yeah, and, and let's be realistic. Nobody ever wakes up that morning going, woohoo, today is the day we're doing OSHA training. I'm so excited like it's Christmas morning. And I think because traditionally we haven't um, we haven't made the topic exciting, I think um, especially when you look at the millennial generation, they are more interested in experiential learning. We know from studies that hands-on training, you're going to learn and, and get more value out of that versus online training. And again, there are offices where online training is a good fit for them. But I think for the most part, I'm seeing that people want, they, they admit that they don't know what they don't know. They want you to tell them what they don't know, and they want systems in place that's going to make it easier to maintain in the long run. Yeah, and um, uh, boys should really be serious because um, when you look at all the OSHA nightmares, you look at all the OSHA uh, everything, I mean, men are just crazy. I mean, all over social media, you'll see somebody having a ladder out of the back of the truck who climbs up to a window and stands on the air conditioner to place, some, and you're just looking at it like, what is wrong with people? But um, so what, what are the biggest uh, injury to worker um, issues? I mean, if, if, if a dental assistant or a hygienist or a dentist listen to this says, you know, I, I just personally don't want to get injured. How, what, um, what's going on to get a, uh, someone working in the dental office injured? Well, let me go back to um, how you um, said you, you could find all these uh, pictures of men. To be honest, when I put my PowerPoint together and I use those slides, I cannot find any with women in it. Not to say that they don't exist, but it's very difficult to find and be kind of gender equal with regards to that. So I think that's hilarious. And if you ever watch Ridiculousness, majority of those videos are men. But um, as far as um, workplace injuries, the... Um, Preventing workplace injuries, I think it all begins with education and knowledge and having a culture. Honestly, we have dental offices where we saddle the dental assistant with the responsibility of being the safety officer. And on top of that, she's supporting sometimes two docs if they're short, if somebody calls in, uh, he or she's supporting two doctors. They're also the Steri Fairy for the practice, so they're cleaning instruments. And the they're Steri Fairy? The Steri, yes. They're I the have ones never who heard of the Steri Fairy. Every office should have a full, I think, a full-time steri fairy, someone who just takes care of instruments all day long for everyone else. But sometimes they play, they put on these multiple hats. And then we go, oh, and by the way, here's an entire, here's four or five manuals that I've been collecting for the last 20 years. You figure out what to do with it. Pam, our previous safety officer, won the lottery yesterday, took off. You're responsible now. Just do what you need to do. And we haven't set them up for success. There has to be a team dynamic. We have to have proper support from the leadership. I think this is in any business. I think you'd agree. Proper support from the leadership that sets forth the expectations. You have that person who's been empowered and given the proper resources to tackle this responsibility. And then you have to have the buy-in from the team. The team has to understand the why behind why they do what they do. Not just some finger wagging going, you need to wear utility gloves. But helping them to understand why it's important that they wear those utility gloves when they're cleaning instruments. So where did you get the uh, the name, the, the OSHA lady? Karen Daw is the OSHA lady, delivering OSHA and infection control training. Yeah, so my last name is three letters long, D-A-W. But you would be surprised how many people want to add an E or an S or an E-S or spell it D-O-L-L -L because they misheard it and people weren't finding me. But without fail... Whenever I called an office to remind them that, hey, I'm coming in on Thursday to do the training and the consultation um, at, at noon, 
it, invariably somebody's always saying, hey, it's the OSHA lady on the phone. Or if I walk in, there's a big sign that says the OSHA lady's coming in today. And as a brand, it made sense. It told everybody what I did. They didn't have to know my name, but they could find me. And I actually got that federally trademarked too. So now if you were to look me up, you'd find the OSHA lady synonymous with Kieran Doss. You don't need to know my name as long as you know what I do for you. So one of the problems we have is uh, this show is uh, international and um, the our, I, I've done podcasts on location in Paris and uh, Cambodia, Malaysia, and Tokyo. So to our international people around the world um, that don't live in America, can you explain to them what does OSHA stand for and what it is and what is the difference between OSHA and infection control? Mm -hmm. So OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and overall it's the overarching umbrella of safety. So when we think about infection control and bloodborne pathogens and, and hazard uh, chemical hazard usage, they all fall under this umbrella of safety. Anything can be safety related. If I see an extension cord along a walkway, well, that's a safety hazard there. So anything that can create a hazardous situation in the workplace. Um, different countries have different entities. Some have specific entities. I couldn't tell you their names. And then some actually don't have a regulating a regulatory agency that oversees us. But OSHA is primarily concerned with employee safety and this is where i think a lot of people get confused a lot of business owners get confused they think well osha doesn't apply to me i'm the employer and then i have to say well how are you classified for tax purposes because if you're paid as an employee of your corporation you are an employee if you're you're getting paychecks you're an employee and therefore osha standards govern you as well and besides i have doctors that will wear short sleeves but insist that their dental assistants and hygienists wear the, the long buttoned up uh, jackets. And I'm looking at them going, that's what kind of example are you setting? You're telling people to do as I say and not as I do. So I always like for the business owners, regardless, to practice what they preach or to mimic or set the example for what they want their employees to do as well. And, and it, it, it was hard to change because I got out of school in 87 and that's when everybody just kind of started wearing gloves. But all when I when I started practicing in eighty seven, the old guys didn't want to wear gloves. Oh yeah, and and, and then um, the first thing that hit me really really hard is I got out eighty seven, eighty nine. The HIV started um, slowly coming out, and the first thing we're in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's one hundred and twenty, you know, for half the year, and we all wore shorts and short sleeve shirts. And they told us we had to wear long pants. I actually lost a hygienist over it because I said, well, we're going to do this. And she goes, well, I'm not, I'm not wearing pants in 119 degrees. I, I can get a job across the street. And it, it was tough. I mean, because we went from this really laid back fun coming to work in shorts and flip flops and t-shirts to now being all, you know, professional. Uh, but it's funny how times uh, um, change. So, um, mm -hmm. so OSHA is more about worker safety. And um, so, so OSHA cares more about the employees than the customers, would you say? It's, it's about yes, yes. And something that business owners that are listening in right now need to consider are those subs and temps that they utilize. Some questions they should be asking is, Who's going to maintain their HEP B records? Is it going to be you or the temp agency? Because you got to keep that on file for 30 years if it's your responsibility. Length of employment plus 30 years. Who's going to um, provide the bloodborne pathogens training for that individual? Is it going to be you? Well, if it's you, you've got to invite them in an hour before the start of their shift to do the OSHA training. Or is it going to be the temp agency? And then who is responsible in the event of an exposure? So all employees, even if they're a separate temp, you've got to treat them as if they're regular employee, unless there's an agreement or an understanding in place with the temp agency you're utilizing. Hmm, that is, uh, that is interesting. So, um, when you go into an office, um, how, um, is it a combined, it, it, it's a combined, uh, program of, um, OSHA and infection control? Is it an afternoon? Is it a day? How much does it cost? How do they find, you know, walk us through that. So it really depends on the need of the office. I offer anybody who's interested a 15-minute complimentary discovery session because there is no one-size-fits-all. I have to figure out, 
what are your major concerns? Um, what is it that you're hoping to accomplish? Where you are and where you need to be and what we need to do to bridge that gap. So during that call, we can assess a lot of that. And then we can either determine whether or not I need to come in to do an assessment where we look at your systems in place. What do we need to create? What can we enhance? Or we might do virtual consulting. I have offices where I just work strictly with a safety officer. I might do a, um, a webinar-based training for that office, but then the consultant and I are meeting routinely to figure out what is it that they need to get their office into compliance. So it can be virtual consulting and training or in-office consulting and training. And then I also speak and I'll be posting my speaking calendar. I'll update that on my website so they can see, hey, there's a seminar coming up with Karen. I, I, I want to go and check this out. And your website is Karen Daw, D-A-W, Karen Daw. Yep, or you can find me at theoshalady.com as well. It'll link you directly to my website. Okay, let me check that. Theoshalady.com. Let's see. Uh, and it'll just straight, take you straight to karendaw.com. It'll redirect you. Yeah, I must have cookies on you or something because it took me right to Karen Daw. I couldn't even yeah. go to the Osha Lady. Yeah, uh, yep, exactly. It just redirects you directly straight there. So what are what are my homies going to find? If they go to karendaw.com, what are they going to find on your website? They're going to find some information about what the services that I offer so they can make a good decision about whether or not it's a good fit for them. I realized early on in my career that if I provided OSHA training the same way that I received it when I was at Ohio State, that people were going to tune out, that they weren't going to pay attention. And you put me in front of a room full of dental students that already didn't want to be there. I knew I had to do something differently. So I kind of approached it with a sense of humor. I use uh, real world examples. I share stories over my career. Um, one of my recent offices that I visited, the dental assistant had one of the treatment rooms quarantined. And I thought, well, well, why is there a yellow caution tape blocking people from entering that, that operatory? No kidding, Howard. The staff had been complaining for months that there were animals in the attic. They don't know if it were rats. They don't know if they were bats. They weren't quite sure what it was. The doctor, rather than hiring an exterminator, sealed off every known entrance that these critters could have entered and exited from. And eventually, as you can imagine, the scurrying in the, in the ceiling stopped. Well, nobody bothered to go in there and clean up afterwards. And what happened was one day the dental assistant went by the room and heard a plopping sound on the plastic that was covering their chair. It was maggots falling from the ceiling vent into the treatment room. Oh from my God. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. And that actually is an OSHA violation. Having a vermin infestation, I'm not saying one field mouse or one ant or one cockroach, but having an infestation, that is an OSHA violation. People don't think about that. Yeah, so I'll tell you, my two so I had that problem at my home. Um, I And it turned out to be that if you have your um, trees in Arizona close enough to jump from the tree to your roof, you get these roof rats, and then the roof rats go down and live in your walls, and I'm sitting here with four boys and they're coming to me saying, dad, what is that noise? And it's, it sounded like, you know, sound like wild animals in the wall. And oh my God, it took this guy a week to get them all, catch them all and all that kind of stuff. But I got to tell you another thing, and this is embarrassing and I probably shouldn't say it. Um, but um, so we're out here in the desert. It's really, really hot. And um, I had, I was doing a root canal and the patient, the swelling afterwards was like crazy. And, and I, um, and my, uh, oral surgeon and everybody thought, man, that it must have been some weird super bug or something. And then about six months later, it happened again. And luckily they're, my friends are saying, Howard, you know, something, something's wrong. Cause th these are two crazy infections. And you know, th these are once in a lifetime infections and you had two of them. He goes, when's the last time you had your water tested? And this was like, I don't know. This is like, uh, 1994. I remember it was it was after April Fool's Day of 1994. I know that for a fact. And I said, "What? Water? What? Your water lines? Have you ever touched your water?" I, I said, "I and I know I have water, but I don't. I've never. Oh my God! I had a guy come out and test the water lines. He goes, "It's a heat sink. It, the water's probably 140 degrees." He says, "It's just liquid mold moss. It's it's just insane." And uh, so. Um, we immediately um, um, switched to each operatory having its own bottled water. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I don't, uh, but I knew a lot of people that dentists have told me this. They're saying, well, you know, I live in Ohio and we got good water and it's clean and I, I drink out of a hose. Uh, is drinking out of a hose in your backyard the same as irrigating a root canal? <laughs> no. So, and, and that kind of reminds me of, you know, you said earlier things have changed uh, over time. I, I was trying to say my orthodontist was a smoker. And the reason why I know that is because he, when he didn't wear gloves, I could taste the nicotine on his fingers. And then Karen would come home from her braces, braces adjustment, pinging off the walls from the nicotine. And my parents couldn't figure out why. But now we can't imagine working on patients without gloves. Uh, I think that water quality issue, it's not nascent. I mean, we're, we're aware that bacteria can thrive in water. But I think that the concept of testing our water, even if we're using sterile water or distilled water, and there's some manufacturers that will tell you, don't use distilled water in their dental units because you know distilled water is not in a state of stasis and it's going to leach the minerals from your units so you need to follow the manufacturer's recommendations for what type of water to use uh, i prefer the bottled water system but there are offices that are saying i use distilled water in my bottles and therefore i don't need to treat it or i'm in ohio and i'm in a county where we have really good water well bacteria thrives everywhere and bacteria is going to find a way into your water lines and you think about how narrow those dental unit water tubes are, and that just that slow flow rate, well, it's the ideal ideal breeding ground for bacteria. And so if your listeners take away one thing, one thing from this call, it's to please go back and test your water lines for bacterial count. Don't use a a meter. If somebody comes in and sticks it in your water in a cup of water and says, oh, your your water's fine, they're only testing for dissolved solids in your water lines. That's a TDS meter. It comes with any zero water pitcher you can get from Amazon. What we're looking for is heterotrophic bacteria. And there's a couple ways you can test for that. You can test for that in office using a paddle system, or you can use a mail-in testing. Mail-in testing is your gold standard. They use an R2A auger system. That is the one that's going to hold up in a quarter law but if you want an easy pass test uh, system and that's less expensive than mail-in system at least initially do an in in office water testing you'll get results in three days you'll know if you have an issue okay though are those resources on your website karendaw.com uh, they, they will be i will add it just for you with a link that says howard on yeah it. or or that post you made this morning you could follow it up and say i just talked to howard about this post and uh but um but I'll how, on the how often form, yeah. um should people in the hot desert of Phoenix and Palm Springs uh, test their water lines more often than the cold areas of Maine and New Hampshire? Not necessarily. And what the CDC and many manufacturers will tell you is it depends. If you test and you fail, you got to do something. Shock your water lines, test, shock, test, shock, until eventually the water readings are good. OSAP, the Organization for Safety of Substance Prevention, issued a white paper on this. Their recommendation is quarterly testing of all your water lines. There are manufacturers that uh, make uh, tablets that's very popular that are used in water bottles. Their recommendation is monthly testing initially until your water lines pass, then quarterly after that. And there are manufacturers that make straws that sit in your water bottle. They'll tell you to test once a year. So you really got to go by the manufacturer, but initially you got to test. You got to test to see if you have an issue, then treat your water lines and continue to test and treat until your water lines are good. And then follow the manufacturer's recommendations for frequency of testing after that. Wow. Um, so, um, so, I, I want to switch gears completely to HR, and I also want to switch gears to uh, DSOs because I know uh, dentistry, um, every organization, every tribe, uh, when they don't like someone, the first thing they start to do is dehumanize them and, and do all their tribal stuff they've always done. And right when I got out of school, the bad guy was capitation dental insurance, and then the bad guy was the PPO. Now the bad guy is the DSO, dental service organization. Well, let me tell you something. Those guys, um, if they do something wrong, they're, they're, everybody's talking about it. But it seems like every time I see a major OSHA violation, it's just some good old boy country all alone by himself. Dennis, in the marketplace, you lecture to everyone everywhere. Do you think DSOs take this more serious than an individual because they live in an aquarium? I wouldn't say that they take it more seriously. I just think that they have the resources to dedicate individuals to oversee the program. Whereas when you have a mom and pop dental office and it might be one dentist, one assistant and a front office staff in some places, 
they really don't have the resources to dedicate someone to oversee this entire program. Um, I've seen, I've actually heard some horror stories related to large corporation dentistry. And then I've seen some mom and pop dental offices that are doing phenomenally. They're, it's all about for me, as a consultant, it's all about coachability. Are they coachable? Can I go in there and work with them? And nine times out of 10, they've asked me to come in because they want to make sure they're doing the right thing. The other part of the time, it's because they hired a new dental assistant who heard me speak somewhere and they want, they said, oh, well, she said you'd be a good trainer, but they're not willing to implement anything. Um, so I wouldn't say, I, I don't want to vilify anybody. Anybody who's open to receiving help, I think you've already taken the first step. If you're willing to acknowledge, okay, I don't know. I don't really know for sure if I'm compliant. Uh, and I really want somebody to come in and assess and maybe do a mock inspection and let me know, hey, validate all the things we're doing right, but then also help me identify all those areas where I can be doing things better. So what happened, like if you just Google uh, dentist OSHA violation, I mean, I mean the first one that pops up, uh, I mean, just, just the very first one says, uh, um, court orders dentists to pay $85,000 to employee fired for OSHA violations. What the hell do you do to have to write someone a check for 85 grand? Mm -hmm. So go, going back to when you were talking about HR, here you had an individual who brought their concerns to the manager's attention and to the attention of the, uh, the dental employer as well um, regarding, I think that one was with Sharp's disposal primarily um, and, a, and post exposure protocol due to a needle stick. And nobody was doing anything differently. And they were being very dismissive. Going back to what I said originally about, you know, listening. We live in a society where people want to be heard. And if this is something that your team members are bringing to your attention and you're being complacent or dismissive about it, well, now you've opened up your practice to that liability, the possibility that you might be sued. So what happened with OSHA, what happened in this case was this individual was dismissed from the office. And we have whistleblower protection. And this person technically should have been protected from retaliation from the employer as a result of them complaining to OSHA about what was going on in the practice. The practice dismissed her, so they had to uh, pay, provide her with back pay in addition to an award as well. Yeah. Um, do you think a lot of OSHA complained? You, you said it's a complaint process. In most states, yes. In it most states, yes. Do, what percent of those uh, complaints you think are from uh, disgruntled employees? I, I, I would say a lot of them, whether they're current or past employees. And I think the reason why they became disgruntled in many cases is again, they did not feel they had any other recourse. That's the, that's what I hear from a lot of people is, you know, I'll have people contact me after I visit their office and they'll say, well, doctor's not going to implement anything. And I just feel like I have no, no, nothing else to do other than quit the job. And so I wrote an article in RDH Magazine about this called Talk or Walk, What to Do About Subpar Infection Control in Your Office. And I said, a first, first thing to do is communicate with them. Let them know where you stand. Let them know that this is unacceptable. Let them know why it's unacceptable because sometimes dental employers don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Approach it first, communicate with them. And then if, you ha if absolutely you are jeopardized, know that you can leave, find another office. In some, some instances, that's not plausible, then know that you can contact and reach out to the local dental board in OSHA as well. Yeah, because I couldn't actually, when I got, was in college, I, I when I got out of college, I couldn't quit my job because there was only one Chippendales in the whole Phoenix area. <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, I just have to look for other work. Um, so on that, so I want to go back to that water lines because um, it, 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 this is what spanked me the hardest. Dental unit water lines, water quality. You talked about the OSAP white paper and recommendations. Um, what do you, do you think there's anything, um, um, it says provide guidance for manufacturers of dental units, dental water treatments. So I see on dental town, people talking about, you can buy like a big machine that sterilizes your water for the whole office. Mm -hmm. And then other people mm -hmm. have that. Well, I'm just going to use a bottle, a sterile bottle of water in each operatory. Mm -hmm. uh, wh wh which one do you prefer? I like a combination of the two. I like to see that water filtration system. I think that those those are great units out there. I do still on occasion, because they're not 100%. They'll tell you they're 99 point something percent. On occasion, I will see offices, primarily through lack of proper maintenance, where they will have failed water lines. And we're talking about water lines. We're talking about your hand piece, your air water, your ultrasonic scalar lines um, that may fail even with those water filtration systems. Rare, 
but on occasion it does happen. So that in combination with a straw or a tablet or a liquid in the bottle, I think is going to give you an overall comprehensive uh, program that's going to make sure that the water that you're using, the water you're being exposed to is safe. And then again, monitoring, testing, testing, testing. Yeah, and I, I want to say something about HR um, where we um, really listen to this closely because this is really profound advice, um, but uh, it might take you a lot of years to remind this. Um, you know, you always hire dental assistants because they have five, 10 years experience and can make the best anterior single to temporary, but they have no organizational skills. And I look at your sundries bills and it's like, four percent this month eight percent next month six percent i'm like dude your your supply bill variance is a hundred percent well she's a great artist she has no organizational skills i see that the front too where you hired this girl because she had five years experience in a dental office knew all the codes but mm -hmm. but then i go talk to her and i say okay well in that office you were on dentrix for five years i'm just curious does uh dentrix have five reports 50 500 how many reports are in dentrix and she has no idea. I'm like, okay, so you sat on a program for five years and you have no idea anything about it. You know, you just, you train to ask. So then I started saying, okay, um, looking back 32 years, the best front office people I ever got were from Chase Bank, were from bookkeepers, you know. Uh, the best employees I ever got were bookkeepers because they're organized. And I can hire, if someone, if I go to hire a bookkeeper in Arizona, they're gonna ask for like, 12 to 15 bucks an hour. I go I go hire a dental assistant, they want $20 an hour. Well, that $20 an hour dental assistant, you couldn't teach her accounting if you put a gun to your head and her head. And there's and your supply bills all over. But I can take a bookkeeper and teach her the art of dentistry real quick. And she's trainable. I can teach her that. You can't teach organizational skills to some people. They're not wired that way. And on this OSHA thing, I mean, um, you, I mean, OSHA, to me, I hate to say this, I'm, I hate to say it to the OSHA lady, but you know, you, the first thing you start thinking about if your dental assistant having organizational skills is that your supply cost or four to four and a half percent every single month. You know, money, mm -hmm. money is answer. What's the question? And then when you say that the the water line should be tested every quarter, eighty percent of the dental assistants in America couldn't even create a system to remind themselves to do something four times a year. Mm -hmm. They're artists. They're 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 artists. And many times they're the ones who are saddled with that responsibility yeah. of overseeing infection control compliance, DOSHA compliance. So I think what every business owner needs to think about, uh, every dentist that's listening in this call, is do we have the right person for that job? Do we? Many times it's just by default. It's the newest person or um, it's, you know, sometimes it's the person receiving the lowest salary in the office that's getting these huge responsibilities. And I think we really need to kind of evaluate, is this a good fit for this per person? If, if my job, my license, my reputation is on the line, do I have the right person that's going to keep my name off the six o'clock news in charge of this? Do you know who's the lowest paid person in my office? Who is? No. The smartest person. We pay the dumbest people twice as much because we know they have to work twice as hard. Mm -hmm. that's, oh. a that's a joke, get it? I get it. <laughs> they pay the dumbest people twice as much as they have yeah. to work twice as hard. And a lot of yeah. times, a lot of times they, they, they are interviewing someone, they, they think they need a quarterback or a running back and they need a dental assistant. And what they need is, is th in this particular case, um, you know, if you got four dental assistants, someone's got to be organized. So you can have three that can crush an anterior single two temporary. Okay, yes. I, I got you that. And maybe maybe your organizational girl would be your last go-to choice on the cosmetic anterior tempor temporary on a high lip line pretty girl. But someone in every department needs to be led by the most organized person. And, yes. and a lot of times when you're interviewing a receptionist, you're like, oh, I'm going to hire her because she's got 10 years dental experience and, and that office used the same dentrix that we use. And I'm like, oh, well, that's great. Why, why did she leave the last office? Oh, after the bankruptcy, he killed himself. And it's oh. like, uh, oh, oh, yeah, that, you know, good, 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 great, great. I really like where this is going. So someone needs to be organized for cost for OSHA, for infection control. And then once again, just for our international audiences, um, if they're confused, what is the difference between OSHA and infection control versus HIPAA? And why are they not the same? 
So OSHA's, again, um, o- overarching responsibility is employee safety. Infection control can be employee safety as well as patient safety. So the things that we do to keep our patients safe, uh, the fact that uh, we disinfect and sterilize instruments. So that would be more your infection control and prevention. And then HIPAA is a whole separate beast. So that's um, a different agency that's responsible, that's charged with uh, the protection of patient information, cybersecurity. So that has nothing to do with employee safety. So two separate gamuts. But I think the reason why people lump those two together is because the compliance umbrella. They just put them both under the, they make, they make it sound like it's one and the same. It's two separate entities. There are infection controls more closely aligned with OSHA than it would be for HIPAA because under the OSHA bloodborne pathogen standard, there's a lot of infection control and prevention um, standards uh, underneath uh, 1910-1030, which is the actual OSHA standard for bloodborne pathogens. So there's a lot of infection control stuff in there. So things overlap. So a lot of people think another genre is just, quote, documentation. Is that even a, a, a genre, a thing, or is that... OSHA does require certain documents, our annual training records, our initial But would you put records. that under OSHA or HIPAA or is documentation just a separate thing on its mm-hmm. own? They both have their own documentation requirements. So maybe it might be its own standalone. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and maybe subheadings under under documentations. So do OSHA. you, is there any, um, is there any new um, products, uh, new um, uh, technologies, new, is, is there anything new product wise that's um, got you excited about? New products, technologies, I mean, I, procedures, you know, something, something new in the. Well, it'd be related to safety. And I think the big things that I'm noticing right now, um, the in-office testing kits that's available now, whereas they didn't have that before. And the more that we hear about that's the better. Um, I think um, not necessarily new, but something that I've been stressing because I see a lack of it everywhere I go, proper eyewear when you're using your curing lights because we know the intensity of that blue light has increased over time and yet people will continue to close their eyes or look away when they're engaged in a bonding or or a curing procedure. So using that blue light and the proper eyewear with that. I don't know about new technology. I think there's a whole gamut of new disinfectants out on the market with shorter contact times that are that are safer for equipment they're not cracking or corroding or rusting our equipment i see a lot of comments in your forms related to different types of disinfectant products so i think um not necessarily new but i get excited about everything every time i learn about something i get excited about it because that's one more solution and would you say do more offices get you for osha or infection control i kind of lump the two together i tell them you get one you get the other that's my deal with them. And what, but, um, so, so let's go through two of those things. So I, I want to go, I want to go back to the plan on average. What do you think it costs for you to come down and would you spend half a day in the office? Is it a full day? What, what is your average? Like if I go to McDonald's, it's a Big Mac fry and a Coke. What mm-hmm. is your Big Mac fry and a Coke? My Big Mac fry and a Coke would be OSHA infection control with the one-on-one with the consultant so and one, a mock inspection. So one-on-one would be the most thing you do actually the training in office training they so it's almost like a it's like a cop it's a happy meal right so it's the training so everybody gets the same message then i get the one-on-one so i can support their safety officer and then i do the mock inspection so they know exactly what's going on that's kind of where the rubber hits the road the the doctors sometimes are are not are not aware they're they're well intentioned their team members are well intentioned they think they know that they're doing the right thing but until we actually do an assessment where i'm actually watching i'll sit there some some offices i've stood there for two hours i just watch patients flow in and out of treatment rooms and instruments flow in and out of sterilization and i make a report and then i present it to the doctor and i go okay here are your pain points and again, here are all the things you're doing great, but here are your pain points. And I've got a great resource that's absolutely free for anybody who wants it. And it's created by the CDC. The CDC has a dental summary checklist that they can download and it's free. And it's, hey, here's related to infection control. Here's all the, off, here are all the policies and procedures you need to have in place. And then here is observational checklist. And you can, you can actually download it. There's a, it's called the CDC Dental Check app. They can download that and do an in-office internal infection control audit today if they wanted to. And that's a free resource available to anybody. And I think few people realize, you know, that there are these. So when you do that lecture, that's for the full office. How long would they have to block off patients? Is that a half day, all day? 
So some of my repeat offices, we will go over it in about 90 minutes to two hours. But if it's brand new, I would at a minimum like to have three to four hours with the team. So first time half day, first time half day. And then on the safety officer, is that usually going to be the head dental assistant, the head hygienist, the office manager? Who's usually the safety officer? Primarily, it's a dental assistant. I don't know if necessarily it's a lead dental assistant, but somebody's been saddled with that nine times. Majority of the times, it's it's a dental assistant that I'm working with, and that that really, in some ways, it makes sense because they are hands on. They're in the back. They're in the clinical area. They know what needs to be done back there. Um, but then, in other respects, when I ask them. How much time are you given to devote to making sure that your systems are updated, that you've got the checklist completed, your weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual checklist completed? And they'll say, I'll have to take a lunch here and there, but I have no dedicated time to do this. So if for the for the employers listening today, if, if this is important to you, and we always make time for the things that are important to us, I asked you earlier, how do you squeeze in the show and manage your form and practice dentistry? I think if you love something and you're passionate about something and, and you it's important to you, you're going to make the time. I need offices to, to support their team and give them the time to dedicate to safety. And, and I'll, I'll answer the question her when she asks me, I always get asked that, you know, how do you do it? Um, you know, you, you do all these things. How, how do you do it? And it's like, well, it's easy because I don't do any employee training. Employee training is, is a never ending problem when you have staff turnover. Once you've collected a bunch of people that have been with you 20 to 30 years, like Karen, if you've been with me 20 to 30 years and every day I came by and to see what you were doing, you'd, you'd finally shoot me. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, none of my, none of my staff, I would wants, never do that. They, they don't want micromanage. And then a lot of people tell me, they say, uh, well, you know, it doesn't cost anything to fire someone and get a new person. And, and, uh, oh yeah. And that new person, you got that new dental assistant and she was your dental assistant for a whole year. And she never figured out that your autoclave quit working. And then, but the centers for disease control figured it out and you're on 60 minutes and you're on the evening news and all the dentists in Oklahoma are like, oh my god that's like the nicest guy in the world and and then you tell me that um, there's no problem with employee turnover and that you don't need staff training and you don't need all these things like that and and the reason i um it's so easy for me is like everything that you do well i've got someone that's been worrying about that for 20 years and quite mm-hmm. frankly I, I don't even know what she does or how she does it or um any of that stuff um but so just just fix employee turnover um, you don't want to marry a toxic person, get rid of the toxicity in your life. I see so many dentists um, who found five drinking buddies in college who all think dentistry sucks and the world's coming to an end and buy Bitcoin and all that stuff. And it just sucks them down. Mm-hmm. And then, and that's why you start doing, um, you go get your um, FAGD or MAGD because you'll find out that it's the same AGD people trying to get their FAGD at every damn continuing education deal. And those people love dentistry and they're all excited and they're all going. So once you're surrounded by about five dentist friends who love dentistry, they'll drag you up. And it's the same thing with the staff. If you can't keep any of your staff for one or two years, then I would just go work for Heartland. I mean, just throw in the towel. If you can't fit, if you can't, it's people, time and money. And if you can't get an A or B in people, then all the time and money in the world, you're still going to have inferior results. Uh, so this, uh, this training is everything. Um, so back to the, um, um, the mock and sp- okay. So the lectures half day, when you're onboarding someone new 90 minutes on follow-ups, um, safety officers, usually a dental assistant, um, mock inspection. Um, we talked about what technologies, procedures, practices are you excited about? Um, um, so I know my homies, you, when you lecture, you say, Hey, is there any questions? No one has a question. You say, okay, <laughs> go take a potty break and we'll, we'll start back in 10 minutes. And everybody runs up with their private personal question and everybody has the same personal private question, but it comes to the fact that a lot of dentists are shy introverts. They're afraid to raise their hand and ask. So what, what do you think they're, af- the, the, the scary thoughts are they're thinking about OSHA and why they're hesitating on pulling the, the plug on having you come in their office and get them up to speed? What, 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 is, what, what is the fear factor why they won't um, pull the cord and make a decision? 
Yeah, I think, um, especially with our newer dentists that are graduating with a large amount of debt, it's the least thing, last thing on their minds is safety and this compliance aspect. So I think we tend to push it off and defer it, defer it, defer it, or have this mentality that, oh, it can never happen to me. And um, and I and I want to tell the, the shy ones, especially that are afraid to ask the questions, um, if you're thinking that question, I guarantee you there are other people that have that same question too. And I think that we have to accept that uh, when we, when we need help and not be afraid to ask for that help. I think a lot of people have this mentality that especially, I mean, even the, some of the support team members in the dental office, they feel like they need to know everything or their boss is going to look down on them. And that's not the case. You're not going to know everything. I don't, you know, I know how to change a tire, but I couldn't swap out an engine in my car. I go to an expert for that. If you need help with something, go to the people who are experts in their field. They're going to people who are, who are not going to like my style. I'm just too, I've been told this in comments. She is too bubbly for a something that's supposed to be a serious topic. I'm not going to be a good fit for you. Find the right mechanic to help you tune up your practice then, if that's the case. Find the right consultant, find the right experts to help you. So I think that sometimes they're afraid to ask. And and for those who think that it can never happen to you, I have a great story. You might have heard of Jen Maroney. She is based out of PA. She went to her doctor to get a root canal, and uh, the doctor passed the needle to his dental assistant uncapped uh, across her face. She was not wearing eyewear, nor was she aware she should have asked for eyewear. The needle slipped and went into her eye. She did not go to an eye wash station. She was not told to go to an eye wash station, which is the first step of any confirmed bloodborne pathogen exposure. She was given a tissue to dab at her eye, which was starting to tear up. This Noel Kelch, a fabulous writer, wrote a whole article about this that went viral. The next day, Jen woke up. She said it felt like her brain was on fire. Well, that's because he had injected streptococcus bacteria directly into her eye, and after several surgeries, she lost her eye. And people, nobody thinks they're going to go to their dentist and lose an eye. And that's the story that I share with people when they go, it could never happen to me. Well, it happened to Jen, losing an eye by going to the dentist. It, anything can certainly happen, and that's what you've got to prepare for. I advise everybody who's listening, walk around your office as if you were an ocean inspector. Look at all the potential unsafe conditions in your practice. Make a list, and then get to, at your next morning huddle, let's chat about some of these things. You are your own best inspector. You are your own best advisor. You're your own best consultant. Wow, that is just a crazy story. Um, but luckily, he didn't get fined any money or anything, right? Yeah, I think they settled, Jen. Uh, I, got, I had a uh, privilege of meeting her at one of the OSAP conferences, and she said uh, she couldn't discuss the terms of the settlement, but she said basically it covered her medical fees. That's it? That's, that's pretty much it. That's what I gathered from that conversation. Oh, my so God. I, she should have retired into the Bahamas. Yeah. What's, what's the name of her an, of attorney? Yeah, I have no clue, but she has a fabulous Facebook page called Jen's Vision, and she's an advocate right now for patient eyewear. So for those of you who are listening, if you don't currently provide patient eyewear, please don't make it optional. Don't let your patient say, oh, but I want to wear my own eyeglasses during this appointment. Uh, let them know it's an office policy or let them know it's it's for their safety. Or heck, just say it's per OSHA. Nobody's going to question it, even though OSHA has nothing to do with patient safety. Let them know that there are policies in place and that uh, they got to wear this eyewear. Don't make it optional. Well, tell her you mentioned her on the podcast and if she wants to come on the show and uh, talk about it because uh, that would just be an, an amazing uh, show. I mean, talk about the rock bottom of everything that can go wrong. And like I say, I confess, uh, I confess that I, in, uh, in night, I opened in 87, 91, uh, it was the year 91, I had two crazy post-operative root canal swellings that, and, and then embarrassingly, I found out that I, in fact, had uh, the San Diego Zoo living in my water lines, and it, it, I felt horrible about it. I mean, I just felt sick, and uh, I even told the people what, what had happened and what I'm doing about it, and and, uh, and, and again, I, I think we might have been a victim in Arizona because you have no idea how hot it is. Like, I remember calling um, um, some dental materials company one time. And I don't think they were realizing back in 87 that when you make that vinyl polysiloxane and ship it to me in a UPS truck, well, in the inside of the UPS truck in the summer in Kansas, it might be 110. It's 140 in Arizona. I mean, I was getting vinyl polysiloxane and it was runny. Hmm. And it's like, I and they're like, um, and, and then over the years, people started figuring out that, you know, that, you know, the diff different scenarios. Um, so, um, my gosh, uh, I, um, so is... 
back to that safety officer. Um, is there any qualities in that safety officer that you've said this work, this type of person works better than the others? I mean, HR is everything. Mm -hmm. And HR, 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 if you get an A or B on people, you can get a D on everything else and be a happy millionaire. Um, is there anything you've seen in that safety officer that you say, that's, that's the one I'd be looking for? I, I think overall in business, we're seeing kind of more of a focus on, on EQ versus IQ. Um, and making sure that you have the right fit. So in a safety officer, someone who's coachable, someone who's willing to take on the responsibility, because, you know, most of the time they're not volu they don't volunteer to be the safety officer. They're voluntold that they're the safety officer. And here they are going, well, uh, when am I supposed to find the time to do this? So if you have someone who's coachable, who's willing to tackle it, and I think the people who do it, you know, eventually they understand the importance of what they do, but they're just not given the proper support. They're basically thrown a couple manuals that they purchased online are thrown at them and they go, here you go, you're now in charge. And they don't know that there are resources available to them, that there are courses they can take that can help support them in this role. So someone who's willing, someone who's coachable, um, someone who gets the reason why we do what we do is gonna be the ideal candidate for that safety officer position. Okay, so under uh, OSHA, um, someone just posted, uh, has anyone worked with a company that they thought did a great job? We are in Illinois. Um, does anybody recommend anyone? So I was wondering um, what, um, who are your best clients? Who, who um, brings you in and says, this, this was great. Um, how, how do they know if you're the right fit for their practice? And how would you answer that guy in Illinois uh, if you're the right fit? Mm, as far as the right fit for the practice, uh, number one, take a look at the websites. You can get the feel for someone's personality and their expertise just by looking at what they have on their website and find the one that's going to be a right fit for you. Find somebody who's going to be able to, to elevate your team, who's going to be able to help you uh, identify the problems and then help you enhance your systems. Not somebody who's going to come in and help you check out the box, unless that's all you're looking for. I, I, I do check off the box training. I don't like it because I know that OSHA is much bigger than that, but to make sure that they're the right fit for your organization, get a good feel for their personality. Take advantage of those free complimentary calls. I offer a 15 minute complimentary call. I'm not going to answer your OSHA specific questions, but I'm going to give you a good sense of what I bring to the table and how I can help your practice. And I think every office should take advantage of that and call, call around. If you talk to me and I, I rattle off some corny joke and you think, oh, this person's just not serious enough for me, well, then you want to find an office with or a consultant that does have more of a serious nature that can go in to just nuts and bolts and cross that off your list for you. I was um, blown away um, this week when uh, three of the best oral surgeons in Texas, their damn autoclave exploded. <sighs> And uh, uh, sent the and the assistant suing him for uh, a, a ton of money. In fact, uh, what did they say in the lawsuit? She said, uh, um, uh, "How much is it?" Uh, oh, she she the dental assistant alleges negligence and autoclave blast and seeks monetary relief between one million and ten million. Ten it's million like dollars. One yeah. million and ten million. Uh, is someone drinking? It shouldn't be your attorney. Why would you say one million and ten million? You should say ten million. But anyway, um, so. Did I before last week? I didn't even know an autoclave ever did blow up. I never even mm -hmm. heard of that before. That I didn't even know that was a thing. And I think that's the importance of getting a really good person who has a solid background in, in OSHA. I, I knew how important it was for me to make sure that I became an authorized OSHA trainer. So I attended all the courses through the Department of Labor to be able to use that title. And I uh, train the trainer. So I go out and I train other OSHA trainers and um and that's because when you think about that sterilizer breaking uh, exploding well they weren't implementing proper uh, what we call a lotto but it's lockout tag out if you have an equipment that can be charged or can be plugged in and 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 is electrified then and it's not it's not working properly that equipment should have been unplugged it should have been placed in storage with the sign that says malfunction equipment securely attached to it so it should not have been able to be sit on a counter plugged in accidentally by who knows you know who knows who happens to be walking by that created that scenario that scenario is completely preventable in my opinion and, and, then, opinion. and then the other thing is you know what i see with humans they always know the right answer as you see them talk about it and apply it to maybe their family or some other business or whatever. But then in this situation, they're not applying it correctly. Like mm -hmm. for instance, if you um, work on many of your things, it voids the warranty. 
Mm-hmm. Well, guess yeah. who? Guess who fixed the autoclave? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Was it the yeah. was it the distributor? Was it the manufacturer? Oh no, it was an oral surgeon because that's mm-hmm. that's who you want to fix the autoclave. Oh mm-hmm. hell yeah, you want that's an oral like- surgeon uh, fixing that thing, not the man. Yeah, so in almost everything you work on, you're not trained to work on. You're trained to be a dentist, and all the other things you work on, it says right there. If you do this, you just voided your warranty. Mm-hmm. So so bring it back to us, and we'll fix it. And if you go on from here. Uh, there's no word. So I can't believe we went over an hour and I, 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 um, oh, we l- did. let me, um, l- l- just last but not least, um, uh, last question, needle stick protocol. Mm-hmm. So, so you just handed your assistant the, uh, the, the syringe and just stuck in her finger. Um, mm-hmm. what do you do? So, uh, so post exposure protocol, every office should have one. It's part of your exposure control plan. If you bought one of those re- paid a couple hundred bucks for one of those ready-made manuals. I'm really not a big fan of those, but in it, there was something, a section called the exposure control plan. And within the exposure control plan, it you're supposed to detail. It actually gives you a template and guidelines already, but you need to detail what you're supposed to do. The very first step is to wash the affected site. And in Jen's case, who had the needle in her eye, you're going to take somebody to an eye wash station. I have heard countless stories over the years of patients getting acid itch in their eye or hygienists getting calculus in their eyes. So the first step is going to be to wash the site. And then there's going to be an incident form you're going to complete, a copy of the incident form, a copy of the bloodborne pathogen standard, and a copy of your Hep B records need to go with you when you go get evaluated. Somebody's got to talk to the patient, convince the patient to go get tested. And then somebody's got to let the front office staff know, hey, you need to clear Karen's appointments for the rest of the afternoon because she's going to go get evaluated at the urgent care up the street. This is already an angst-ridden event. The simpler we can make it by creating an operating procedure around it, the better off the practice is going to be. Wouldn't it be just faster to fire her and hire a new assistant, a, tempor- a temporary? Um, for an exposure incident? Yeah. And, and that, not was, have- that was a joke. Uh, I, I was, was going to say, yeah, that, that, would, that would be interesting. I wonder how, how OSHA would come into play with that one. So um, so if someone wants to bring Karen Daw, MBA, CECM, for Certified Environment Compliance Manager or Environmental? Certified environmental environmental mm-hmm. um they go to karen daw.com i'm trying to think of something monomic for daw there's got to be know. some uh documentation and workers uh, but yeah. anyway yeah uh, i think about that one if, if karen daw um they go to karen um on average what would it cost for you to go in there and do this for a day and get them up to speed i mean are we talking it, it really depends. It, it really, really depends. depends. Are they local? Are they flying me in? So we'll talk about that during that assessment call if they decide to bring me in or if they're going to do virtual training. And um, and what percent bring you in versus virtual? Um, right now, majority of it is um, in office. So I do have offices that fly me out to their practices or they'll have a, a miniature seminar and invite other practices to be there. And while I'm there, I'll, I'll do the, I'll do an ass- assessment for their particular facility. So I would say right now I am probably 75, 25, but it's the virtual part of it is really exploding. So if cost is a concern and, and you don't really need to fly me out and you're looking at some coaching or consulting, we can certainly plan a series of consulting calls around what your what your needs are for your practice. Well, it's so weird to think you'd bring in an infection control uh, lecture to your staff. I mean, their their staff, uh, staff is an infection. Uh, Staphylococcus, isn't that where they got the name staff? <laughs> from staff infection yes um yes so um you guys you guys and by the way last question i just want to get one feeling um are more of your customers larger group practices dso's than the individual no they tend to be individual practices they tend to be individual practices yeah absolutely yeah because the the dso's they never they never know when to brag you know they get beat up all day long Mm -hmm. and they, they have departments that fear this stuff and yeah, again, yeah. every time yeah. I see someone hung out to dry, it's always a good old boy by himself. Mm-hmm. It's never, yeah. uh, it's never this. So um, people um, take this stuff serious because now, uh, you know, I just read in case the other day, uh, a patient needs a liver transplant. And indeed they think they got the, uh, the hepatitis virus from this exact dental office. And mm-hmm. when, and if you're going to go to court and bring in some viral DNA guy that sits there and says, no, she got this one 
from your place. And uh, it, so it's a whole new world out there. Uh, you don't want patients losing an eye. If that girl wants to come on the show and talk about losing an eye, um, maybe that'll scare them into the deal. But uh, Karen Daw of Karen Daw Consulting, karendaw.com. Karen, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show today and letting all my homies uh, listen to the Osh Lady for an hour. It was a it pleasure. Is, it is a pleasure. It's all mine. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you.